very, very očin, očin. Very očin. That sounded dangerous. <laughs> you probably saw his video. Don't get me started. All right, I'm ready. Hello everyone, today we have a very special guest, Thomas. Oh, I'm special. <laughs> <laughs> You're very special because it's the first video on my English YouTube channel. Oh my gosh. Have a guest. Wow. Yes. I'm so excited. Well, it's an honor. And you are special in many other ways, but... Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I feel honored. Um, yeah, thank you for joining me yeah. today. And Katya was on my podcast last week, so you should check that out. <laughs> Shameless yeah. promotion. Link will be in the video description. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But glad I, we can do the exchange, the collab. The collab. It's also my first collab. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice, yeah. yeah. And also your first collab. My first collab. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, I don't... Yeah, I... Yeah, I think it is. It is. Yeah, big times. Cool. Very important. Well, I'm super excited. So today we're going to talk about language. Yes. I talk about language all the time. So all my friends get super bored about it. But no. I don't think I've had the chance to really. No, actually, that's not true. I really, I think I've talked about it before. And, and <laughs> I, didn't I didn't get bored. OK, good, good. Because, yeah, it's what I study. So um, <laughs> hopefully I can talk. And I can, I can talk for three, four hours, no problem. So just cut me off if I start going too long. Sounds good. Um, do you want to tell first just a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am Thomas. I am a third year PhD student at MIT in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. So there I do research on language. So the way I would typically describe it is it's kind of interdisciplinary and it's at the intersection of maybe three different fields. So like linguistics, psychology, and computer science. So I did a computer science undergrad. I was at Princeton. Woo, yeah. <laughs> go Tigers! <laughs> go Tigers. Um, Today's, uh, they have an alumni day today. Really? At Princeton, yeah. I did not know that. That shows you how connected I am to <laughs> Princeton. Not much. Um, but I did, I did major in computer science there. I did a minor in linguistics. Oh. Then I spent two years um, teaching. So I was a high school math and computer science teacher. Then I did a master's in linguistics at Cambridge and other Cambridge, not Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, Cambridge, UK, um, and then came here. So yeah, I think I draw on some of the tools of computer science. So especially nowadays, you've probably heard a lot of this stuff around AI and language models. So we, we do a lot of stuff with language models, um, but also like our goal isn't necessarily to make, you know, the next chat GPT. It's more to use the tools of computer science and language modeling to better understand how language works in the human mind. Um, and I don't do too much neuroscience, even though I collaborate with a lot of people who are, you know, doing more neuroscience stuff. So I'm relatively um, naive about like how stuff works in the brain, mm -hmm. um, but I do collaborate with people who do a lot of brain-oriented research. So it's a really cool spot to be in because it's very collaborative, very mm -hmm. in, uh, like interdisciplinary, having to draw on a lot of different disciplines to try to make progress uh, and understand how language works. Yeah, that's so nice. Yeah. So why shouldn't we take language for granted? Great question. Don't get me started. Um, so we all use language in some capacity. I'm pretty sure like every human uses language. There have been some extremely niche cases. So for example, um, like children who were severely neglected, and there have been like a few cases in human history of like children who were basically not given any linguistic input, or sort of before. Um, you know, like deaf people were sort of recognized or had as many um, opportunities. You know, children um, who are deaf but born to non-deaf parents, for example, would not necessarily get as much linguistic input. Although, you know, you would still have some amount of communication. Uh, but basically, aside from pretty niche cases, um, everyone uses language. And that takes many different modalities, right? There's spoken language, but there's also sign language. There's, you know, there's also um, a lot of the way we interact with language nowadays is via text and reading, right? Like we spend so much time on our phones and reading books and um, scrolling through websites. And so, so much of the way we use language is actually in the reading form, not in the spoken form. Uh, we listen to podcasts. We, you know, we, we use language for communicating information and like, it is such a universal fact of human life. And we just, I think, simply take it for granted. Yeah. Um, but if we really think about what's going on, it's kind of crazy, right? Like I have some idea in my mind. Um, I make a series of, in my case, since I'm, let's just go with the example of spoken language, I make a series of sounds with my tongue, with my mouth, with my lips, with my vocal cords, right? Um, so these are just vibrations in the air. And they're being picked up by this microphone right now, right? But they're just vibrations. It's this continuous analog signal it goes through the air and it reaches your ears and you decode those that analog waveform of vibrations and recover the meaning that I wanted to communicate, right? 
And so I have some idea that's just purely in my mind and I'm able to communicate it into your brain just through this analog medium. And there's a very like high rate of information transfer, right? Like you could listen to like a one hour podcast and start from like know nothing about a topic to like suddenly having a lot more information about that. So it's a very like high throughput uh, way of communicating. And in addition to being very high throughput, it's also very robust, right? So think about all the situations in which you're using language. You might be sitting in a noisy cafe. You might be, you know, um, like shouting across, you know, across a room. Um, and think about the other modalities, right? Like you might be um, using sign language and having to, you know, balance um, communicating via sign language with also visually paying attention to everything else that's going on in your room. And there's all these distractions. And yet people are able to communicate the meaning robustly. You know, the fact you don't have to be in a recording studio like this mm -hmm. in order to successfully communicate. It happens every single day. Um, and I think it's just super cool. And we just take it for granted. Um, and there's just so many interesting facts about language, so many different facets of, of how we communicate using language. Um, I think for me personally, I became more and more interested in this as I started to learn different languages. Like, so I grew up in Japan. Um, you know, um, I went to school in English, but like I have relatives who are Japanese, I'm half Japanese, um, so I know Japanese. Um, I started studying Russian in uh, when I was still living in Japan. Um, yeah, and it's just like being exposed to more languages makes you realize that they're all solving this problem of communication in their own way, but yet they have such different things mm -hmm. going on, right? Like they're just such different rules, such different sounds, such different features depending on the language, and yet they all sort of converge to different solutions of how to communicate, like efficiently, robustly. Uh, and yeah, I find that super fascinating. Yeah, this is, Sorry it sounds like rambling, magic. It's, it does sound like magic. Thank you, finally. Some people are like, <laughs> language is boring. What? Uh, no. No. No, it's not. Can you tell me a little bit more about how do we translate our thoughts into words? Sure, yeah, let's see. Uh, so we can sort of go through- I know it's a very the, complicated Yeah, question. yeah, it's a complicated question, but we, let's go through sort of like some of the pipeline, I guess. Of like mm -hmm. there's sort of different stages along, like these can kind of correspond to different sort of subfields within linguistics, for example. Um, so at, at one level, right, there's something called phonetics, which is just like the different sounds that exist in a language. So I'm gonna mainly be speaking about spoken language because that's what I'm familiar with. But you know, just, just so you're aware, there are people who study sign language and it follows like the same principles, but with a different modality. But I'm just gonna stick to t talking about what I'm familiar with. Um, so phonetics is like, okay, what are the different sounds that exist, right? Um, and different languages have like different numbers of sounds, mm -hmm. right? Like um, the sounds are generally speaking, like some are very common across different languages, like the T sound, T. It's like pretty pretty common, okay? Um, there are other sounds like English th, th mm -hmm. that are actually very rare. So like, even though English speakers have no problem saying this or that, that's actually, there's two different ths, right? There's th and th. Like mm -hmm. one is what's called voiced and one's unvoiced. So mm -hmm. unvoiced is th, like think, and uh, voiced. Sink. Sink, yeah. <laughs> it's hard because that's sort of like the closest sound, right? If, you, if th is not part of your native language's mm -hmm. um, inventory of sounds. Um, there's different vowels, right? And what's interesting is that like a lot of these are kind of continuous spaces. If you think about vowels, right? Like you can sort of continuously shift from like a A to an E, right? You could say mm -hmm. I, like you can sort of morph the sound. It's a continuous mm -hmm. space. And yet we turn these into discrete categories, right? And so a lot of and the- And by discrete categories, I mean like discrete. Yeah, like, like it's just, it's either an A or it's an E mm -hmm. or an I or a different sound. Um, even though the space of possible vowels is kind of continuous and you can you can pick a sound that's like halfway between two mm -hmm. vowels, um, we have what's called minimal pairs, right? So minimal pairs are like two words that differ only by a single sound, um, which, which is evidence that those two sounds carry a meaningful difference. Mm -hmm. And so something that like is a, a category, a sound that actually is categorical in that sense of like you can't like you can create a minimal pair with a different sound. Those are called phonemes, right? Um, and so- Can you uh, give an example? Yeah, so for example, like in English, you know, TH is a different phoneme, like TH is a different phoneme than S, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that's not the case in a lot of languages. Like in English, you can think of words like think and sink, and those are two different words. Mm -hmm. So you know that these are two different phonemes. Um, but let's like, in Russian, for example, there's no TH. Mm -hmm. So like, if someone says, like that's why you might hear a lot of people with accents 
pronounce the word think as sink mm -hmm. because it does not make a contrast in, mm -hmm. in other languages, right? Um, yeah, uh, there, there are a lot of other examples. So like English, English actually has a lot of sounds, relatively speaking. It has especially a lot of vowels. It has way more vowels than like a lot of other languages. And when I say vowels, I don't mean like, oh, A, E, I, O, U, there's five vowels, right? Mm -hmm. Like English has way more than five vowels because those letters can each be pronounced in several different mm -hmm. ways, right? Interesting. Yeah. And do, so, do you know how many? Oh, exactly. I don't know exactly. I should know. But it, and it also depends on which accent you have, uh -huh. right? So like which dialect. Uh -huh. So like, for example, in American English, um, for example, I pronounce the following two words the same way. Mm -hmm. C-O-T and C-A-U-G-H-T. So like the a, a C O T is like a small bed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then C A U G H T, the past tense of catch. I mm -hmm. pronounce both of those words as caught. Mm -hmm. Someone who speaks like I am not just gonna say British accent because there are many different accents within mm -hmm. uh, the UK, but um, sort of one, like within many um, dialects in the UK, those two words we pronounce differently. So those two words we would be pronounced like, okay, I'm going to butcher it, of mm -hmm. course, because this is not my native accent, but it would be like caught and caught or something, mm -hmm. like something. I was like, oh, I'm cringing because it's like not perfect, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're different vowels. Mm -hmm. Like those two words are just not pronounced mm -hmm. the same. But in some, di most dialects in America, most American speakers, I would say, pronounce them in a merged way. Although in like parts of Boston or New York, like there are sort of regional accents in the U.S. that still pronounce them mm -hmm. differently, but not in the same way as like the British, right? So it would be more like caught and caught or something. <laughs> like again, like I, I hope I'm not offending anyone by my terrible <laughs> um, attempts at an accent, right? But so the number of vowels depends on which dialect, but it's like over 10 for like mm -hmm. any dialect of English um, and probably, probably more than that. Yeah. Meanwhile, like um, uh, I think Russian only has five. Uh, there's some debate about whether it's five or six, right? Mm -hmm. It's basically whether like, um, yeah, anyway, but it's it's like the vowels are more like, there's just the A, E, I, O, U, you know, it's like the same kind of vowels, but you can't pronounce them in different ways, mm -hmm. right? It's sort of like, and then written, in the written form, there's there's more, there's like 10 vowels. But the thing is like, ah and ya, it's like, they're not, it's the same vowel sound. It's mm -hmm. just whether there's a, like a ya, you know, in front. Mm -hmm. So they're not like two, they're written as two different vowels, but the sound, like the vowel sound is the same you know, or like, you know, eh and yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like the same sound of, if you just ignore the consonant part of it. Um, yeah, and so like Japanese also only has like five. Wait, how is it the same sound? So like, if, so uh, the, the vowel part, right, mm -hmm. is, so like the vowel is means the unobstructed okay. flow of air. So like okay. a vowel versus a consonant is like, Anything that you can make oh, where you're not, you're not obstructing there. So just ah, mm -hmm. it's like you know mm -hmm. it, something that you could sing, mm -hmm. right? And like you know you can't sing a T. You can't say <laughs> t -t 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 -t. Yeah. like you need to like produce just uninterrupted mm -hmm. airflow, right? And so if you just imagine you like record it, we can like record it on the computer. You can take the ah and you can take ya and you can just clip it so that if you just take the part that's like the air flowing coming out. It's the same mm -hmm. ah sound, and it just starts with a y. Yeah. And then you have y Good. plus mm -hmm. ah is ya, mm -hmm. right? And same with like you know yeah, o and yo. Mm -hmm. Like it's the same. Depending on the language, there are different sounds that make contrast, right? And so we were talking about you know some of these different examples. Um, so like consonant length would be another example, right? In Japanese, there's the word kata, which means shoulder, and kata, which means like one, past tense of to win, um, and those are different words that differ only on this um, consonant length, but English doesn't have that. Uh, same with like vowel length in English, right? So you have, um, you know, what we, we would call long vowels in English, like, you know, cat, short A, long A would be like Kate. But those are two different sounds, ah and a, right? They're just different sounds. Whereas um, you, don't, you don't get a different word by just extending the duration of the same vowel, mm -hmm. but in Japanese you would, right? So obasan means uh, aunt, but obasan means, um, means grandmother. Mm -hmm. So these are just like different words. In this case, they have to be related, but it's not, they don't always have to be related like that. So basically like the, at the sound level, it's sort of like um, every language kind of carves up the space of possible sounds in different ways and makes different distinctions. Um, I think that's also kind of why it's hard to not have an accent in a different language because it's just the sound systems are different. Um, some languages have more sounds, some languages have fewer sounds, some languages have like more restricted kinds of syllables. So for example, in Japanese, it's basically like a consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant vowel structure, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've ever like met a Japanese person, their name is probably something like Tanaka or mm -hmm. Yamanaka or like, you know, whatever, Takahashi. So it's like, there's always a consonant vowel, consonant vowel, generally speaking. Um, whereas like in English, 
or even like Russian would be an even better example, you have these insane consonant clusters, right? Like you can put four consonants in a row, no problem. Which like most languages don't mm-hmm. do that. But like in Russian, like for example, I, I'm not going to butcher these, but you're the native Russian speaker. So like you'll have things like взгляд, you know, which is like, that's like it, that's literally <laughs> one syllable. Mm-hmm. A Japanese person just cannot pronounce that mm. without saying, without kind of inserting more more uh-huh. vowels, right? Like they would have to say something like Buzugriato or something mm-hmm. because it's like, it's just, there are no four consonants in uh-huh. a row in Japanese. It does not exist, but there's tons of them in Russian. Um, yeah, I, I Russian never even really thought about it. But yeah, it's, like, not, it's, it's, it's not hard, hard for you. Yeah. It's not hard for you, but it's like super hard for, for like Japanese speakers or like Hawaiian is another example of like a, a language with like a very small number of, of sounds. Um, and so, yeah, it's just like m- a more like restricted space, but then you can still make words and, you know, it's, it's just really interesting how, how different languages can be with that. So anyway, that's basically how sounds work in different languages, or like at least an intro to that. Um, okay, your original question was about um, how do thoughts become speech, right? Or like mm-hmm. how do you produce stuff? And I feel like I'm not fully answering that yet, but I feel like the answer to that involves basically sentences, right? Like, how do you turn a thought into a fully formed mm-hmm. sentence with some structure? Okay, but in order to know what a sentence is, you have to understand what a word is. And in order to understand what a word is, you have to know what sounds are. Mm-hmm. So we have to kind of go up the chain. But, okay, so the next chain would be words. So, the curve, yeah. yeah, I guess we have to discuss what a word is before we can get to what a sentence is. Um, and this is very interesting. So there's a whole, you know, subfield in linguistics of morphology and, you know, words can be broken down in different ways and different languages do this very differently. Um, So for example, in English, um, we have a lot of words and words can have prefixes, suffixes, right? So you can have a word like unbelievable. So it has a, you know, un is a prefix, able is a suffix, and then you have the root of the word. Um, You know, that seems pretty normal. Um, English is still a language that has relatively little um, what's called like inflectional morphology. So inflectional morphology is when you change the word ending to mean different things. So Russian would be a good example of mm. a language with a lot of inflectional morphology, right? You have the base word, but then it can take on many different endings that m- depending on what role is playing in the sentence. Um, and again, this is one of those things that makes Russian hard to learn for someone who speaks English because there's just not really a good analogy to mm. that, right? It's like, oh, okay, something is the direct object of an action. So therefore... I have to change all the endings like, you know, that's Mm -hmm. not intuitive to a lot of English speakers, but it would be very intuitive to speakers of other languages that have that and and many languages do. Um, I think it's also interesting once we talk about words, you know, like how do words even get their meanings, right? And um, how new words are constantly Mm -hmm. being created. So, you know, especially these days, it seems like every year there's like so many new words coming Mm -hmm. into existence. Um, or old words get used in new ways. People say stuff. There's all this, um, you know, like Gen Z slang, right? Mm-hmm. So like people like the first time I heard someone say like, oh my gosh, Riz, you know, I'm like, what is Riz? You know, <laughs> have you heard this t- no. expression? Mm-hmm. Riz apparently comes from charisma. Uh-huh. So someone uh-huh. who has a lot of Riz is like someone who is oh. like, you know, charismatic mm-hmm. and has game. I feel like that, but that sounds like old generation. Like, oh my gosh, you have game. Mm-hmm. Like that sounds so like old, like, oh my gosh, are you a millennial? Ugh. <laughs> but like nowadays people say like Riz or whatever. And that's just like, it comes into existence. A lot of language change is driven by younger speakers. Um, and then it sort of gets mm-hmm. adopted by, right? Like it's like people have to learn the language, but they're also using and inventing new ways to say stuff. Um, I actually find this part really fascinating, like how new words come into existence yeah. or new ways of using words. Like there are a lot of things that I, I don't know, like ways people use words that are not super intuitive. So for example, part of my language, but like, okay, the word ass, right? <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. Originally meant like a donkey. So you have a, you have an animal and it's called an ass. But of course this animal was not considered a very nice animal to be compared to so people would start saying okay stop being such an ass to mean like stop being such an idiot or something so it took on this sort of negative Mm -hmm. connotation and became like a sort of mild curse word right and then weirdly people have started using it like i think maybe like the next stage was like someone saying dumbass right like oh Mm -hmm. you're such a dumbass not like you're a dumb ass but you're a (laughs) dumbass like one word Mm -hmm. and so it went from being you're a dumb donkey like you're a Mm -hmm. dumbass to, you're a dumbass and like mm-hmm. the stress the intonation kind mm-hmm. of shifts right it's kind of like dumbass mm-hmm. not dumbass mm-hmm. right and then sorry I, i'm gonna get i'm gonna get blocked by spotify or whoever for saying mm-hmm. ass too many times uh, 
But then it became this like uh, suffix, right? So then people started saying other things like, oh, that's such a big ass car. Or like, mm -hmm. a, you know, like it's not just like dumb ass, but you can have big ass. That's a, cra <laughs> that's a crazy ass idea, right? And like ass yeah. now is like a suffix. Mm -hmm. And then people now use ass to like in, in kind of all sorts of weird ways. Like I heard someone say like, you know, that's, um, you know, okay, like I think the context was someone draws, you know, a picture of a tunnel on like a wall mm -hmm. and then someone drives a car into it and crashes. Right. And, you know, like, you know, the comics Looney Tunes mm -hmm. where like there's like these coyotes and they do all kinds of stuff like that. Someone like saw that. It's like, oh, my gosh, that is some Looney Tunes ass shit. <laughs> and it's like, wait, like what? Like you're taking like a noun, like a proper noun, adding the word ass to turn it into an adjective. So <laughs> you add a suffix that basically like it's sort of similar to the suffix yeah. esque, right? Mm -hmm. E-S-Q-U-E, which again is a weird thing because English borrowed this adjectival suffix from French. And then we start adding esque to certain words like, oh my gosh, that's such like a Picasso-esque painting, oh. you know? But then mm -hmm. you can be like, if you want to be a bit more like slangy about it, you could be like, that's some like, wow, look at this Downton Abbey ass mansion over here, you know? Like, <laughs> and it's like, a, it, it's like now a part of, mm -hmm. like a part of English, in a, like not in formal settings, but among informal settings, it's like kind of normal now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's just like one example of the ways in which language is constantly changing. And honestly, Profanity is one of the areas that changes very quickly and is the most like creative. Like mm -hmm. I don't know, in English the word fuck is like the most flexible word in English. Like it's just unbelievable. Like English does not have has it's so not that meanings. flexible, but it has so many meanings. And it depends <laughs> so much on like the context, right? Or like shit, like you could say, You're the shit. That's a compliment. Or, like you're the shit. Like that's a really good thing. <laughs> if I say you're shit, that's terrible. And the only difference is saying the. Mm -hmm. And like one of them is like a great thing and one of them is like really bad. You know, and it's like why? You know, or like, you know, like there's such there's these shades of difference. You know, for example, if you say like, you know, that's fucked up versus that's fucked. Like mm -hmm. they're both kind of bad, but they have slightly different mm -hmm. meanings. The it, other interesting thing about fuck is that it can also be um an infix. So we talked about prefixes, suffixes. English doesn't have infixes, so stuff that you put into the middle of a word, except mm -hmm. fuck. So going back to the earlier example with unbelievable, for example, you could say, oh my gosh, that is unfucking believable <laughs> And like you put the word fuck inside of another word. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with like any other word in American English. I think in British English you could say like, absolutely, and <laughs> that would be something similar. But it's like profanity seems to be in like a special category sometimes of like being especially flexible and creative. That's so uh, cool. I'm curious how people like even agree on the meanings. Yeah, I mean that's that's the interesting thing about language is that it's like there is no authority on the language, right? Like English only exists in the minds of people who speak English, right? Like if everyone who spoke English, you know, agrees to start using a new word, mm -hmm. it, it's like how can you say it's not a word? Like it, it doesn't even have to be everyone, right? But like. You have language purists who will sometimes be like, that's not in the dictionary, that's not mm -hmm. a real word, or mm -hmm. like, that's incorrect. But like, why? That's completely arbitrary. A dictionary is just a book that some people wrote down to try to standardize the language. But language is always changing. Um, and it's really just like, it only exists uh, like among, like in the mind of the speaker. So if the, like the majority of speakers, not even the majority, if like a community of speakers mm -hmm. agrees to use something mm -hmm. and it has a meaning that's understood, then it's like, at least in that dialect, it exists. And then there's a question of like, does it spread beyond that particular location? Does it start to become, you know, part of global usage and all of that? But, uh, you know, like, we're now in a pretty unique situation with English being so global. I mean, typically languages were only spoken in a relatively constrained geographic area. So it would be like just a group of people who generally shared a lot of cultural attributes and stuff like that. Now English is spoken by like, you know, two billion people, mm -hmm. a lot of whom just use it as like a lingua franca for communication. So yeah, anyway, um, yeah, words, like words are always coming into existence and changing their meaning. And like, I don't know, words also, words also have so many different meanings, right? Like there are, um, what do you mm -hmm. call it? synonyms or no, not synonyms. They have um, like words are ambiguous between yeah. different things, right? So if you give me like any word, pretty much like in English, like I don't give me a word, like I don't know, pick any word mother mother so mother could be like um a noun but it could also be a verb right like you can like you could say like oh stop mothering me you mm -hmm. know or something like and it's like it's obviously related but you can kind of use it flexibly in these different situations um that's another interesting thing about english like any noun can generally also be an adjective right like and you don't have to add any ending right mm -hmm. so if you have like a 
curtain that's in the shower, you can just say, oh, it's a shower curtain. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah. you can't do that in Russian. You can't just put two nouns next <laughs> to each other and have mm -hmm. one of them be automatically become an adjective. You can add an adjective ending, mm -hmm. right? But you know, you can't just stick two words together. Yeah. But English does that all the time um, because it doesn't have as much inflectional morphology, right? Like in Russian, people are looking, they expect words that are adjectives to end in a certain way mm -hmm. so that it fits within the case system, mm -hmm. right? But English doesn't have that. So you, you don't need any particular ending for something to be an adjective. So just stick it all together, it's mm -hmm. fine. Do you want to go to the next level? Next level, yeah. Okay, so I guess this is where we can maybe start finally answering how we turn thoughts into speech or into into full sentences, right? Um, so one way to think about this is the rules that govern how you put sentences together. So we might call it syntax, right? So syntax is grammatical rules, like how you put together full sentences in grammatical ways. Um, and an interesting thing to study here, if you want to know how a thought that's in some abstract form gets into a full sentence is thinking about ways, like two different ways to say the same thing, right? So for example, I could say like, I give water to you, or I could say, I give you the water, mm -hmm. right? Um, so English has this alternation, it's called an alternation, right? Where there's two ways of saying the same thing. One where you say, you know, I give X to so-and-so, and the other, I give so-and-so X. Mm -hmm. um, but there's many examples like that, right? Like you can also think of um, just sort of, you know, double prepositional phrases, right? So if you have something like, you know, the, the bottle cap, you know, fell from the table to the floor. Mm -hmm. But you could also say it fell to the floor from the table. Mm -hmm. And like the order of the two phrases doesn't really matter. Some might sound more natural than others, but the point is you have flexibility. And so there's certain rules that govern like what's considered a grammatical sentence, but those rules still give you a lot of freedom. So you have to constrain yourself to the grammar of the language, but it's not like the, the mapping from meanings to forms is not one to one, right? Given some meaning, there's often multiple different ways of expressing that. Um, and so it's really interesting to study how people make those choices. So what governs why people would choose one option over another option if you mm -hmm. have two ways of saying the same thing. Um, yeah, that was actually one of my earliest projects in grad school was to look at an alternation in Russian, actually, uh -huh. um, and like do an experiment about when people would choose to use option one versus option two. Interesting. Yeah. My guess is that there is like a lot of like cultural. Say more. No? Like, I mean, uh, at least like maybe like different versions, like some sounds mo sounds more formal mm, versus yeah, informal. Yeah. And so like if you're talking to somebody who is like your boss, you would use like one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's super interesting. Yeah, and I definitely think um, like formality is this like whole other axis, right? Like this is super important in like Japanese, for example, mm -hmm. like the way you talk to someone, like who, who that person is in relation to you will completely change the kind of language you use. So I think, yeah, that's a whole dimension that's really interesting. And there's a whole field of like sociolinguistics, mm -hmm. which investigates like interaction between language and like society and like cultural things. Um, and then all the, the systems of like what are called honorifics. So like Japanese and Korean, for example, are two languages that have a whole system of honorifics. And there's so many different ways to, like there's so many different pronouns. Like there's so many different ways of saying you. Mm -hmm. you know, English just has one way of saying just you. Based on, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff. Russian has two ways of saying you. Mm -hmm. Japanese has like, it's gotta have at least 10 ways of saying wow. you. Yeah, it's like, it just so depends on, on the context. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's not what we actually, that, that, that is an interesting thing, though, but that's, that's not what we mm -hmm. were looking at. We we're looking at um, like two ways to say the comparative constructions. If you're comparing two things, mm -hmm. you know, you can either, you know, you, you have a comparative adjective mm -hmm. um, and then you can do a comparative plus the like the genitive case of a certain thing. So, for example, how would you say like um, in Russian, like um, my time is more important than your time? My time is more important than your Okay, okay. So so you use the form with like chem twayo, right? Mm -hmm. So you can insert this chem, mm -hmm. which in English would be translated as like than in this mm -hmm. case. It could also be other things. Um, but in like to make comparisons, you could also skip the chem and mm -hmm. then you could say like vajne twayo vremini, right? Mm -hmm. um, without chem. And then, mm -hmm. okay, so then there's sort of, there are two options yeah. for saying this. So again, super niche question, but it goes back to this this idea of given some idea, what, why mm -hmm. did you choose to say chem twayo in this case instead? Like, wh why did you make that choice versus 
the elder alternative, which was also an option? And does it depend on like what factors are going to influence that? Um, and we did an experiment mm -hmm. um, where we asked people to generate sentences that had comparisons, um, and we manipulated like the length of the upcoming thing that they have to describe, right? You're comparing A to B. Mm -hmm. And so B could just be something really short, in which case people tended to use in terms of like, like the number of words and mm -hmm. like the whole phrase, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so like, for example, we had uh, like, uh, like these visual pictures mm -hmm. where someone has to compare like, um, like a boy to these animals and the animals could be like different colors, different patterns and mm -hmm. different sizes. Um, and there's like a box indicating like which animal you have to compare the boy to, right? And so, you know, you have to say like the boy is bigger than the elephant. Mm -hmm. okay. It's obviously mm -hmm. a bit fantastical, right? But like the boy is bigger than the elephant. But depending on what other animals are in the scene, in order to fully provide enough information, you might have to say something like the boy is bigger than the, you know, blue striped elephant mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. So we can manipulate yeah. how long or complex mm -hmm. that phrase is. Mm -hmm. and what we found is that like when that that phrase is like more long and more complex then people were more likely to use chim like mm -hmm. that form that has an extra word mm -hmm. so there's multiple ways you might interpret that but it, it could one interpretation is that like people are inserting this extra word to like kind of pause and like buy a bit more time yeah. so that they mm -hmm. you know you you're about to say something long so you're giving yourself a little extra time to like plan that mm -hmm. that longer part mm -hmm. but if it's something short then you can just skip that and then you know mm -hmm. say the word directly um you know, I also am interested in this from like a language learning perspective. Like as a non-native speaker, I know that, in, for example, the skipping chem means you have to inflect. So using, again, inflectional morphology, you have to change the case yeah. of all the words, right? So it, it would go from being in the nominative case to having genitive case endings. And as a non-native speaker, that might slow me down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I might choose. Even as a non-native speaker. Even as a non-native. Okay. Good. <laughs> even good. Okay. Good. Oh, uh, it, as a native, native speaker. speaker. Yeah. Is good to know. Good to know. Speaker. So if it's like yeah. super long and contains all these adjectives, and then you have to like, okay, it's like. Because you need to think like, about like which words. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It's like okay, it's like you know whatever. Like you know this boy is like umnyeye, you know Balshova, you know Zelyonova. Uva or something. <laughs> and, but, but you could also just say Chem Balshoy Zelyonye Lev, right? And then. Um, I, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to non-Russian speakers, but <laughs> and it was interesting to see those results. Like we just got Russian speakers to participate in this experiment, and then you can just plot the data and see that it like diverges based on um, like the length and like mm -hmm. these manipulations in the experiment. Um, so again, like that's a very very small way of answering the question of how a thought becomes um, um, speech, but. Yeah, a big way to do that is to look at these choices that speakers have and why you might choose to say one thing versus another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is this like the level where you usually stop like the sentences or? I mean, you could go beyond that and start talking about like what's called like the discourse, right? So like longer range things like, okay, in this context, we've been talking about this topic. Um, but yeah, generally, like I think sentences are often seen as kind of a, a pretty fundamental unit. Um, in terms of it expresses mm -hmm. some event or action or something, and there's a subject and an ob object. There's some sort of self-contained thing, and then things beyond that are just combinations or like concatenations of mm -hmm. sentences. A sentence is a pretty fundamental thing in linguistics. Um, there's all these different ways of of representing sentences, right? So sentences are generally hierarchical, mm -hmm. right? It's it's like you could say something like you know. I saw the man, you know, I saw the man who saw the woman, you know, and mm -hmm. like you're nesting yeah. things inside each other, right? It's like, I think, you know, I think this water tastes good, you know, you think that I think this water <laughs> tastes good, and you can start like nesting stuff. Yeah. So there's this like hierarchical recursive nature, um, and you can draw sentences as trees where, mm -hmm. you know, each tree, like the, when I say a tree, it's like, it starts from a root and then you have like branches and then you can nest trees inside of other trees and, mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. Do you want to talk maybe like very high level and very briefly about like what happens at the neuroscience level? Yeah, sure. Sure. So uh, just a caveat is that I, I'm not really um, an expert on the neuroscience, but I've taken some classes and I work, I collaborate with people mm -hmm. who work on the brain. Um, and so I can say, you know, what I know about that. So this is mainly coming from, you know, I, I took a class with Ev Fedorenko. Um, at MIT, who is a neuroscientist who studies the language network in the brain, um, you know, and I, I've interacted with, with neuroscientists who work on language. So this is um, the extent of, you know, my expertise. 
But um, generally speaking, there is a language network in the brain, meaning a set of areas in your brain, mm -hmm. generally speaking, left lateralized, so the left side, left hemisphere, mm -hmm. um, predominantly in most people, and it's selectively active when processing language mm -hmm. or producing language. So how would you measure that? Okay, so there's a technique called fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, if you've ever had to take an MRI scan, you go inside this little super claustrophobic mm. machine, which actually it's really nice. They like put a little <laughs> pillow and they put a little blanket over you so you don't get cold. And then they tell you don't fall asleep. And I'm like, <laughs> how am I supposed to not fall asleep? It's so comfy in here. Um, so I've done many of these experiments mm -hmm. because I'm friends with neuroscience people and they mm -hmm. are always looking for participants. participants. <laughs> uh, so I've done many of them. And so in order to, let's, see, let's say you want to test where, which parts of the brain are like selective for language, right? So what you want to do is you want to show two minimally differing sets of stimuli, mm -hmm. where the only difference is mm -hmm. language and everything else is basically controlled mm -hmm. for, right? So what you can do is you can show people sentences and ask them to read it. Mm -hmm. And then you can show them something that's very similar to sentences, but is not. Mm -hmm. So you could show them lists of non-words. Mm -hmm. So it looks like text, like all the visual features are mm -hmm. kind of the same. It'll look like from a distance, you'd be like, this is just a sentence. But you, yeah. linguistically, it does not have any meaning and does not consist of words and does not have a structure. So you can't make any sense of it. And so you scan people. It, it takes a couple hours, right? Um, I mean, the, I think you can do it in a shorter amount of time, but to get a lot of data, you want to mm -hmm. have them spend you know, a couple hours in the scanner. Um, and then you take snapshots of their brain using the scanner and you uh, can see sort of where the blood is flowing. So you get what's called a bold response, which mm -hmm. is like a blood oxygen level um, score. And then that response tracks, like the, the hypothesis is that that level of bold activation is consistent with like neural activity, right? Mm -hmm. Because when, you're, when your brain is like consuming a lot of blood and blood has to move oxygen to a certain part of the brain, that part of the brain is more active. Um, and then you look at sentences, and then you compare it to the non-sentences. Mm -hmm. But everything else is similar. And then you see basically which parts of the brain are more active in the sentences compared to the non-sentences. And then if you do this, you, you, you find consistently across many people, across many languages, mm -hmm. that there's this set of areas that are um, specifically activated uh, when processing language. Um, that's sort of the extent of my knowledge. Uh, Things can go wrong, so mm -hmm. I'm also I have some um, you know knowledge about that. So there's something called aphasia, mm -hmm. which is a language disorder and often happens due to strokes. So if you have a stroke, you know blood doesn't go to a part of the brain, and then you know um, you if it's if that part of the brain that gets affected is part of the language network, you know it can affect your ability to produce or to comprehend language, and it can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. Um, Another interesting fact, so this is actually, um, I talked about this in, in my lecture at, uh, in DC. I, I was there like helping teach a class um, last week. Um, but basically, you can, people have done studies looking at predicting neural activity in the language network in humans using representations from language models. Mm -hmm. So we talked about a bit about this in our uh, other episode, right? But like you can take these vector representations. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> You can take these like representations of sentences coming from large language models yeah. and then train a simple... Which are basically like vectors. Vectors. They're just vectors. Yeah. Like and then vectors. use that to predict patterns of neural activity. So you basically have a matrix representing like the voxels, the, the, mm -hmm. the brain activity in, in, from an fMRI mm -hmm. like scanning session. And then you have like a matrix corresponding to like the vector representations for words in a sentence. Mm -hmm. And then you train a linear, like a linear classifier to basically, or not a classifier, mm -hmm. like a linear regression to um, predict from the neural, from the language model mm -hmm. representations, predict the um, activity, mm -hmm. neural activities in the human brain. And it actually like works pretty well, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. Like you're taking this artificial neural network, mm -hmm. right? It's like artificial brain. It's not really a brain, right? But it has, it contains information yeah. about language, you know? Similar sentences will have similar representations in there, and you know, highly different sentences will have different representations. 
also these models are trained for next word prediction, mm -hmm. which is something that we humans are really good at as well. Like mm -hmm. if I start saying a sentence, you're very good at predicting what I'm going to say. Um, and so maybe it's not that surprising that actually with the right techniques, you can show that there's overlap in information between the representations in the neural network and the representations in the human mind, human brain. I mean, it all sort of depends on what you mean by representation, right? But mm -hmm. like in this sense of like being able to predict activity from one from the other, then yes. Um, so when I saw that result, I was like kind of, whoa, that's cool. That's um, actually very interesting. Yeah, yeah, super interesting stuff. Do you want to talk more about human language versus AI? Just yeah, like absolutely. <laughs> yeah, let's let's. I feel like there is so much. There's so much. Yeah. So research. we're recording this in 2024 when <laughs> everyone has now used ChatGPT. I think people thought that um, human-like language AI was further away, mm -hmm. but now I think everyone takes it for granted that that's almost a solved problem. Like, obviously, there are ways it could be better, but. In terms of generating human-like fluent text on a diverse range of topics, mm -hmm. check. Okay, it can do that. In terms of understanding prompts that we give to it, yeah. I mean, it makes mistakes, but like generally speaking, it's pretty impressive, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what's what exactly is going on? So at a basic level, language modeling is just getting some probability distribution for words in some context, right? So you give it a context. That's a very good way to put it. Yeah, I mean, that is, that is what a language model is. Like mathematically, yeah. it's a probability distribution for words given but do a you think it's like also? Oh, well, yeah. I guess that's the topic of this <laughs> yeah. question, but is it also like similar? In other ways? In, in human language. That's oh, yeah. So, you know, we are, as I, like, we are good at predicting yeah. words, right? Uh, now, why are we good at predicting words? I mean, it could be that there is something very fundamental going on in our brain that we are also trying to predict the next word. And, you know, it's, sometimes people in language processing will separate out production and comprehension as like two different things and you can study them separately. But also there are fundamental connections between producing language and comprehending language. Mm -hmm. Because when you're comprehending language, you're kind of also trying to model the person you're listening to and predict what they're going to produce next. Mm -hmm. So it's like hard to be a good comprehender without having a good internal model of production right mm -hmm. like you kind of have to use your mm -hmm. internal language model both to generate language and to comprehend language right so they're very intertwined um and again like language models is the same way in ai right you have a probability distribution for words given some context so you can give it a context which could just be a prompt mm -hmm. right and then what you're doing is you're sampling yeah next words mm -hmm. and that's basically it. it's just all about like how do you train the model and how do you do the sampling so the sampling, like the most naive sampling, is just like pick the most likely word. Mm -hmm. so if you're like, okay, given some context, pick the next word, pick the next word, pick the next word, and you're just generating words one at a time. Mm -hmm. If you always pick the most likely word in context, mm -hmm. you'll get something really boring. Yeah. So then there's a whole bunch of ways to like not just pick the top one, but pick sample, yeah. you know, f with probability. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, and then so it's a bit more stochastic. Mm -hmm. You can do some sort of beam search. So you can like, you know, you might pick two words in a row that are not not likely, but given the third word, then actually they're um, they're quite likely, right? Sure. Right. So you could say something and you know, you don't necessarily only want to consider one word at a time. You might want to have like what's what's considered a beam mm -hmm. of different hypotheses mm -hmm. of a certain size and then sort of pick, you know, sort of in, in chunks of, of more than one mm -hmm. word. Um, so there's all these different ways of like doing the generation. There's all these different ways of doing the model training. Um, like chat GBT and stuff like that use something called reinforcement learning with human feedback. So you mm -hmm. take like a, a, you just take a language model, but then you, you give it some supervised data mm -hmm. coming from human feedback about what constitutes like a successful chat or a successful conversation. Mm -hmm. And so you're giving it a bit more direction than just predict the next word. You're also giving it some guidance about, okay, not just predicting the next word, but predicting continuations that would constitute a successful chat or a mm -hmm. successful combo. Um, and yeah, there's been a lot of success with that. Um, I think there's, you know, one, one thing people say is, okay, well, humans don't just use language. Like we're not just trained on large text corpora. We are agents in a world and we interact with other people. We are always learning language and using language in these settings that are goal oriented, that are social. Um, now we have these multimodal language models. So mm -hmm. they're not just trained on 
purely text. They're trained on multiple modalities. I'm less sure about like the whole agent thing. I think some people are trying to do stuff with language models as like agents mm -hmm. that can actually like interact with a like, virtual world and stuff like that. So it's definitely a very active area of research. Um, I do think there's very there's something very fundamental about language modeling, like just predicting the next word. And then on top of that, we can add on all sorts of other modules that do different things. Um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly an exciting time to be working on like language and AI because it's things are moving so quickly. On the other side, it's harder and harder to actually work with the state of the art models because mm -hmm. they're so huge and a lot of them are proprietary. Yeah. And it's like, you know, like a small neural network, you can just run it on your laptop, right? Like GPT, GPT-2, mm -hmm. like I can just download that, run it on my computer. Mm -hmm. GPT-3, you can't run that on your computer. It's too big. It has like 175 billion parameters. Mm -hmm. You know, GPT-4, forget about it, yeah. right? Like, so, yeah, there's this issue of, like, the state of the art is exists within this kind of proprietary setting, and yeah. it's a bit harder to do research with, yeah. Which I feel like limits the progress. Yeah, yeah. But it's also, like, what would it mean if, like, the average person or even the average university doesn't have the resources to yeah. train these models, right? Like it's just, it costs millions of dollars mm -hmm. just to train a model. Um, like hosting a model to do like API calls and stuff. It's like they're spending millions on just the servers for, for this stuff and people are willing to pay. Um, so I don't know, I think like maybe people have to think about how to do collaborations between academia and industry. I think that's gonna become quite important it's it already is important yeah. right like collaborating between academia and industry and you'll see a lot of people like have joint appointments right like like mm -hmm. you'll have professors who also are sitting uh, you know in a company you'll have post you can do postdocs you can finish your phd and then do a postdoc in an industry lab mm -hmm. so normally you'd just do a postdoctoral fellowship at another university but not like you can go be a postdoc at like a tech company mm -hmm. you know and then come back to academia and become a professor or something and like there's a lot more crossover uh, but I, st I still feel like there is very little like in terms of like having access to the models the, and like the, the largest yeah. language models yeah no i know what you mean it's it's hard right because for a long time you could do like for gpt3 for example you could do api calls so it's like mm -hmm. you, you can pay and you can pay like a few cents per api call or whatever it is and you know given some word you can ask it to generate the next the, given some context generate the next word but what a lot of people are interested in is like the internal model yeah. representations. Um, and those, they, they might not release those, right? They're not necessarily gonna release the weights of the model. Yeah. Because the weights of the neural network are like all the internal parameters that cost them millions of dollars to mm -hmm. train. So they're not just gonna release those. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a bunch of numbers. Like it's literally mm -hmm. a file with billions of numbers in it. Mm -hmm. And that's their, that's their main product. But that's very valuable to them. And so they're not just gonna make those accessible to anyone. Um, so yeah, it's an, it's it's interesting. Yeah. Can you tell more about like the connections between what we know about language models? Yeah. How they generate mm -hmm. text and how humans produce. Yeah, yeah. Services? I can say what Maybe I know. Maybe like similarities. Which is, yeah, some like similarities and differences. Yeah. So. Um, because okay, maybe like the context is that like a lot of people say that those like artificial neural networks are basically our brain, but like on the computer. Yeah, yeah. But it's like, I feel like it's That's too a bit big simplistic. Of a, yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, I think it's plausible that um, something within your brain, let's say the language network, right, which is this part that's specifically selected for language, is doing something very similar to what next word prediction language models are doing in AI. But it doesn't mean that your whole brain is just a language model. Mm -hmm. In AI, a lot of work recently has been on, like especially sort of post GPT-2 and 3, has been on language models as these multitask learners, sort of like universal models that, okay, they're mm -hmm. language models. So mm -hmm. People have used this term like foundation models, right? But like they're just these like big, big models trained on a huge amount of data. And then by prompting, you can get it to do different tasks. So let's say you want a model that can write code. Okay, well, code is actually, that's just language modeling, right? It's just language modeling where code is part of the language. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's say you want a model that can do math. Okay, well, math, you can also reframe math as language modeling, right? You could say, like, you know, question, what is two plus two? Mm -hmm. Answer, blank, predict the word. Mm -hmm. Like, you can reduce math to language modeling 
with the right context, right? Mm -hmm. Because inserting context by, by sort of manipulating the prompt or the, the context in the right way, you're making the correct answer be the thing with the highest probability. Mm -hmm. And so even if the, the thing that the model is doing is just predicting the next token, mm -hmm. you can coerce it to act as a calculator. Mm -hmm. However, it's not good at that, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, it seems like, wait a second, you're training a model co that costs millions of dollars and doing this whole like complex language modeling thing to get something that fails at like pretty simple arithmetic, mm -hmm. right? And so there's a recent paper, um, McCoy et al. called Embers of Auto Regression. And it was talking about how using auto, auto regression is basically just another way of saying language modeling, next word prediction. All these ways in which language models, when you try to coerce behavior out of it in this general, like, general sense that goes beyond just next word prediction or sort of like coercing next word prediction to act in different ways, it has, it fails in, in these maybe unexpected ways but that those ways should not be that unexpected mm -hmm. when you remember how it was trained. So for example, um, one of the ways in which it fails is that it's very sensitive to task probability and like the task distribution within the training data. So have you heard of Pig Latin? No. Pig Latin is where you like take words. It's like a game that kids play, right? So you take words and you say like table would become able te and bottle would become auto bay mm -hmm. or whatever. So you basically just like, you say an English mm -hmm. sentence, but you, you do these manipulations mm -hmm. and kids will say it to I like see. their parents won't understand them mm -hmm. or whatever <laughs> okay if you ask gpt4 convert this sentence to pig latin it's going to do great at it because pig latin exists on the internet there's mm -hmm. plenty of pages mm -hmm. that talk about pig latin it's within distribution mm -hmm. if you give it an equivalently complex task but it's that's not represented within the training data mm -hmm. it's not going to be able to do it mm -hmm. whereas a human mind once you know how to yeah. do pig Latin, like if I say, okay, let's change the rules. Instead of mm -hmm. this, okay, instead of like taking the first letter and, you know, putting it at the end and adding A, like just change the rules a little bit. Mm -hmm. You can adapt to that, right? Yeah. Um, so the language models, like, yeah, the generalization is still suffering, right? Like it, it's still very, very biased towards the, the statistics yeah. of the training data, which makes sense for what it is. It's just predicting the next word given the training data. It's modeling this conditional distribution of next word given the context. And, you know, if it hasn't seen that, right? Like, it is kind of, you know, it's a little strange to expect it to generalize to completely novel tasks using only this. Yeah. Now, an interesting thing is like, you know, with math, for example, right? Like, it can do relatively simple math, small numbers, fine, because those are like pretty well represented. But like, oh, one funny example from that paper, the McCoy paper was like, if you ask it to take a number and multi apply the formula, you know, nine over five X plus 32, mm -hmm. it's gonna do great at it because that's like the formula for converting, you know, Celsius oh, to yeah. Fahrenheit. <laughs> and like I struggle with. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that formula like is all over the internet and there are many examples. But if you ask it to do something really similar, like, okay, multiply X by mm -hmm. seven over five and add 33, mm -hmm. you know, like it's not yeah. as good at that because that's just less represented. So wouldn't it be better to train a model like that instead of trying to coerce every possible behavior out of language modeling, like that's not what brains do, brain, like we have language modeling, but we also have these non-linguistic ways yeah. of cognition, right? So if I ask you to write some code, if I ask you to solve a math problem, you're not using your language network. Yeah, so okay. So there's basically been this attempt to like coerce language models into doing any task. And the idea is you just train bigger and bigger and bigger models on more and more and more data. And you'll solve general artificial intelligence by scaling this up. There's also kind of what are considered maybe neurosymbolic models. So ne when people say neurosymbolic, they're referring to kind of the history of AI. So there's been like multiple waves of of AI, right? And so like the original AI systems are what were called symbolic. Like people are actually like hand coding certain rules or like using these symbolic representations, meaning something that's not just like the black box of a neural network, right? So now typically it's like you use a neural network as a function approximator, it's a black box. Mm -hmm. You have some input, you have some output, but you don't really know what's going on inside. Whereas a symbolic model might mm -hmm. actually use certain primitives, use certain interpretable, you know, kinds of objects as part of an AI system 
and it can be combined with neural networks. And then you have something called like a, a neurosymbolic mm -hmm. model. So a, a lot of interesting stuff, especially at MIT, but, but also elsewhere, uses that kind of approach. You know, I think with language modeling, for example, like here's just a, a, a very simple case that you could consider. Let's say you're, you want to have a language model that does math, right? Option one is to just treat math as like reduce that to a language modeling. And then you need to have a language model that can take arbitrary mathematical expressions and then using only next word prediction, get the correct answer. Mm -hmm. That seems crazy to me. Like that seems crazy. Like there's an infinite number of numbers and you really want, you, you want to be able to generalize to any math, like ar arithmetic, like let's just stick with arithmetic, like mm -hmm. addition, subtraction, like multiplication and division. You, will you be confident that just by training on language modeling, you can get a language model to pr produce correct answers for any combination of inputs? Yeah. I'm not, I wouldn't be but confident, right? Like the question of like whether the model can actually learn the underlying rules. Right, right, yeah, so some... it could, right? It, it could in some way, in some black boxy way that we don't know, learn that. But like, why, why do we have to do it that way? Like there could be a more efficient yeah. way, right? Like let's say you wanna help it out a little bit. So you, reduce, you break it into two parts, right? You say, okay, the goal is not actually to just output the correct token. The language modeling problem is instead of, okay, given this prompt, output the correct answer, the prompt is now, okay, given this math problem, output a like mathematical expression or let's say output Python code mm -hmm. that can be evaluated to give the correct answer, mm -hmm. right? Language models are pretty good at writing simple code, right? So let's say you give it um, an arbitrary arithmetic like math problem, even like a word problem, right? Where you have like, you know, John has 25 apples, you know, whatever. And the task is now write a one line Python snippet that will output the correct answer. Now I feel much more confident mm -hmm. that it's gonna get the correct answer because the problem is actually much simpler. It's like, okay, extract the important information from this text and then set up like a, like a one line expression. And then there's a pretty clear mapping based on examples that like mm -hmm. doesn't depend on the specific numbers at all. Yeah. It just sort of depends on the context of the problem. And then you can combine the language model output with like a Python code evaluation, right? So you, you the, it can output code and then you run the code mm -hmm. and then you have the answer. Yeah. And like you've just helped it, right? Like, I don't know, like I feel like modularizing things. Like people have talked about this, right? I mean, it's not like I'm coming up with this idea, but um, if you allow language to be one module, but it can interface with other modules, mm -hmm. like code evaluation, mm -hmm. a calculator, mm -hmm. look up in a knowledge graph or encyclopedia, right? You know, doing API calls, stuff like yeah. that. Like you can still use language modeling as a way to solve this kind of problem, but sort of allow it to step out of the, you know, the, the main output and sort of reference and call, call these other APIs, let's just say, and then, you know, get your answer mm -hmm. through that. Uh, like, have you heard of, do you, do you know Python? Yeah. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's like F strings where mm -hmm. you can like, you put F in front of a string in Python and yeah. then inside curly braces, it'll evaluate anything in that. Like, what if you just ask it, you're basically saying, instead of evaluating, uh, instead of outputting text, you're outputting F strings, mm -hmm. right? So you're outputting text that contains little snippets that can be evaluated uh -huh. before the final answer is mm -hmm. there. Now you've like, it's still language modeling, mm -hmm. but it can take advantage of the power of code and symbolic yeah. reasoning and, you know, provable, like provable, solvable, like kinds of things like, like evaluating code where there's not ambiguity about what, you know, how the code will behave. Um, yeah, that sounds much more promising. Um, yeah, so I, I kind of think that's where it's gonna go. It's gonna be like a combination of very large language models with other modules. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that that's like for producing human-like behavior on various mm -hmm. cognitive tasks. I think people often mix this up with the question of like, you know, sentient AI or something like, you could have a very smart AI that can solve all sorts of problems without any question of like sentience in my opinion. I don't mm -hmm. know, this is now we're getting into some like philosophical yeah. territory or like, mm -hmm. I don't know. But um, yeah, I think ultimately these language models currently are, they're computations, they're, it's a bunch of matrix math um, yeah. It transforms inputs into outputs. Um, language models, I don't think I like felt or s sense in any way that they're conscious. Like they can be frozen, they can be copied, they can be duplicated, they can be teleported across time and space. Like they're they're just information. They're just sets of parameters, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
And so you can have very intelligent algorithms that I think are very fundamentally different than than humans as agents or even like compared to other kinds of um, you know agents like animals or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I'm curious. So I mean, you were talking all about language models, yeah. human language. Maybe like summarize what are like the main differences or similarities between the two. Like yeah. what is so fundamentally different about human language that like language models cannot get, for example, or maybe they get get everything. It's hard for me to think of anything that they don't get currently. I mean, like even a few years ago, I would have been able to give you more examples, right? Like it's sort of combining um, our linguistic knowledge with our world knowledge. I can give some more. I'll give mm -hmm. some examples. Okay, so there was a task. Um, this was before large language models, but imagine the following sentence: the box didn't fit inside the suitcase because it was too big. Okay, what does it refer to? Uh, the box? box? Okay, not the suitcase, right? Mm -hmm. But if I changed, if I said the box didn't fit inside the suitcase because it was too small, now what do you think it refers to? The suitcase. Yeah, and so mm -hmm. the same, like j you changed an adjective mm -hmm. from big to small, but mm -hmm. now that changed what it refers mm -hmm. to, right? But you have to use common sense to figure yeah. that out, right? Like you have to have some sort of world, world model mm -hmm. to think, okay, well, I'm trying to actually put something inside something else, right? Yeah. And so there's a lot of work to try to figure out what are the areas like that in which large language models are still lagging behind. Mm -hmm. Like if you say something like, you know, you know, the like if you like word problems, right? Like you give like oh, the blue box is on top of the yellow box, the yellow box is on top of the green box. Mm -hmm. Is the blue box on top of the yeah. yellow box or mm -hmm. something? Transitivity. Yeah, transitivity. Mm -hmm. Like can it figure that out? But you know, I would argue it's like, is that really language? Like mm -hmm. like you show that to like a five year old, they might understand language fine. But like they just haven't necessarily been taught to like reason thing, things out in that way. Like you mm -hmm. might argue that transitivity is just a basic fact of logic, but people aren't always logical. Like you could have people mm -hmm. who are fluent at language, mm -hmm. use language perfectly, but like suck at logic logic. problems, right? <laughs> like there are a lot of logic problems that are just hard. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I think saying that to master language, you have to also master mm -hmm. all of logic and all of like reasoning about the world. It's like it starts to become a different thing. Yeah. Like that's still a worthwhile goal to pursue. Like I think obviously we want AI that is logical. We want AI that has good world models. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say that makes it its language ability somehow less impressive. Um, I actually was playing around with ChatGPT and I came up with some interesting examples. I mean, these are just things that like are you know like I saw some examples on Twitter and I started playing around with like my own examples. But I asked like ChatGPT, for example you know, a word problem, like it takes a band with four people, you know, five minutes to play a song. Mm -hmm. How long would it take the same band if it had eight people? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the number of people in the band isn't going to change the length yeah. of the song, right? But it's like, it thinks it mm -hmm. does. It'll be like, oh, it'll take, you know, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. It'll take twice as long. Or like, it sort of depends, right? Because mm -hmm. in, like if it takes four people an hour to paint a house and you have eight people, okay, well, you might think it will take half the time. And so you also need some world knowledge yeah. about is this the kind of thing where more people will mean faster mm -hmm. or more people will mean slower, slower. right? Mm -hmm. Like if you have four people and it takes, you know, an hour for everyone to introduce themselves and you have eight people, okay, well, it's not mm -hmm. going to take half the time, right? Mm -hmm. But again, it's sort of like world knowledge and not necessarily language. Um, if by language, you know, we mean putting together coherent sentences that follow the rules of grammar mm -hmm. and accurately predicting you know, next words in sort of this continuous sense, like not where there's like a mathematically correct answer or not, but just sort of like what are words that are likely to come next, um, then I would say language models are really good at that. Um, yeah. One thing that people often will make uh, sort of a misconception, I think, is that language model probability does not reflect factuality, mm -hmm. right? So like the most likely word in a given context doesn't actually tell you much about whether that is part of a factual mm -hmm. proposition. So let me just give an example. Like if you say, you know, um, the water is blank, okay? And you ask a language model to predict a word. The probability that of the word boiling mm -hmm. is probably gonna be higher than the probability of the word liquid, mm -hmm. okay? However, the water is liquid mm -hmm. is like a tautology. Like it has to be true, mm -hmm. so it's always true. And the water is boiling is only sometimes true. Yeah. 
but which one is more mm -hmm. linguistically probable? So what the language model is doing is it's saying, what is the chance of seeing this word given this context, mm -hmm. you know, trained on like corpora from the world that reflect people's usage preferences and choices, which reflects the salience of different things, right? So people are more likely to talk about water being boiling because that might be relevant. It yeah. might be, oh, the water's boiling, turn off the kettle. Mm -hmm. No one is saying <laughs> the water is liquid. Yeah. So, so often like the most obvious simple facts have low probability mm -hmm. under language models because why would you ever say the mm -hmm. water is liquid? Why would you ever say, you know, the like sky blue. the sky is blue? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, however, if the sky was red, mm -hmm. you might talk about that. And so, oh my gosh, the sky is red, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so linguistic probability is not the same as factual probability. Yeah. yeah. And then I guess there are a lot of issues with yeah, yeah, exactly. It'll, it'll say, like, language models will say stuff that's linguistically probable, yeah. but not factually probable. But it's like if you have the misconception that you think language modeling mm -hmm. should reflect facts, then mm -hmm. then you'll say, oh, this sucks at language mm -hmm. model. But it doesn't suck at language. Like a math problem. Like if you ask a random six-year-old, okay, what's 47 times 53? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> if, if they're cooperative, they might tell you a number. It's probably going to be the wrong number. Mm -hmm. So a language model will pick up that the correct next word should be a number mm -hmm. but like if it gets the wrong number is that does it mean it's worse at language no it means it's like not doing the it's not mm -hmm. doing math but it's doing language fine you know mm -hmm. um yeah so i'm trying to think of like cases where it just totally fails um and it's it's becoming increasingly hard to to do that like i mean i use chat gbt on like a daily basis to help with like coding and stuff mainly okay. mainly mainly for coding mm -hmm. right but, like i'll just describe mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm in natural language. And it's so useful to be able to like, instead of having to search on Google or search on Stack Overflow, like <laughs> I kind of just describe so. a problem that I'm having uh -huh. and it will generally help me. It might mm -hmm. take a few rounds, but mm -hmm. you know, um, being able to just input natural language as a query and then get back reasonable results and then follow up and like ask sort of follow up questions is, is really helpful. Mm -hmm. So if by language we mean the ability to parse information out of natural language and, and like communicate even with the back and forth mm -hmm. it's like it's doing it pretty well i think yeah yeah which is very exciting yeah it's super exciting super exciting maybe also scary have you seen some of the latest ai that are like multimodal stuff there was like an open ai model that is like text to video mm -hmm. so you can give it like a text description and it'll generate like photorealistic video mm -hmm. of it yeah it's like it's yeah, kind of crazy and scary it's like mm -hmm. well, all the bad things you the could progress do. is yeah so fast it is fast yeah fun. yeah it's pretty it's pretty wild so <laughs> how would you describe um like the main focus of your research in graduate school yeah great question i mean i've gone through a couple different research areas i told you about this project i did with looking at alternations in russian i feel like i'm still interested in that earlier on i did a project with word order so like training language models on different counterfactual word orders I think now, like I've passed my qualifying exam for to do that, we have to come up with a proposal. And so mainly what I'm proposing for working on for like the you know next phase of my PhD is to better model processing of atypical or impaired language. Um, it's like hard to find the right word to describe this, but let's just put it this way. A lot of language research and especially in the intersection with AI focuses on the typical distribution of language, which is generally speaking unimpaired native speakers mm -hmm. without that many errors it's clean like the, the, the data yeah. sets they'll try to clean them so that they contain like mm -hmm. proper sentences that are grammatical often the aim of language modeling is seen as generating sentences that follow the rules mm -hmm. i'm interested in what happens when the rules are not being followed how do we still make sense of that right um it's also within the tradition of bayesian reasoning so bayesian like just from bayes rule but like the idea is basically you're combining prior beliefs about mm -hmm. something with the probability of, of something occurring. So, so in order to reason about a certain outcome, you also take into account prior expectations and beliefs. That's the idea behind Bayesian reasoning. And so like specifically, I am interested in using language models, but in a way that can reason more about atypical language that doesn't follow all the rules. So that might be people with impairments, non-native speakers, mm -hmm. like, it's really cool. Like you could talk to someone who doesn't speak English that well and still have a conversation. You can still communicate. Every single sentence they say might contain many errors. Mm -hmm. They might not know basic words. They might violate the like agreement. They, mm -hmm. they you know, like all kinds of mistakes could be yeah. there. You 
might struggle to communicate, but like it's not like a binary. It's not mm-hmm. like oh, I either either they speak perfect English and I understand them, yeah. or they don't and I communication fails. There's this whole gradient in between mm-hmm. of what you're able to do to communicate, even in the presence of violations and mistakes and all of that other stuff. How did you become interested in this so, area? It's because I can barely speak English. <laughs> no, I, I think, <laughs> no, I think mainly in speaking other, when I'm speaking other languages, uh-huh. I'm like making mistakes all the time, right? Mm-hmm. And people still generally understand me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I've been in lots of different countries where I knew the language yeah. to varying extents and I'm trying to communicate. And I think that's like one of the coolest behaviors that we have. Mm-hmm. You know, it's easy, like you take it, we already talked about how you take it for granted when you're speaking your own language, mm-hmm. especially with another native speaker of that language, right? So like easy to communicate. Okay, sometimes there are difficulties, but generally speaking, we just forget mm-hmm. how amazing language is. Yeah. You go travel somewhere and then you're like talking to someone and you don't have that much overlap. Now it's interesting, right? Like you're struggling to communicate. You're like, what's the word for this? You don't know the word, so you're trying to rephrase it in another in another way. You're saying a sentence and you're maybe in your mind, you're translating it directly word mm-hmm. by word from your native language, but you kind of know that that's not how they would be yeah. saying it in their language, but you're hoping that they'll still understand you, you know? And mm-hmm. so you're doing all this stuff. And then on their side, they're doing all this stuff to reconstruct what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, they're trying to understand what you were. What you mean, yeah. They're kind of reconstruct the message, right? And the same thing with uh, language impairments, like aphasia, right? Like it's a, I mean, it's a pretty devastating diagnosis. If someone has aphasia, it's like, that's really tough. Like, oh my gosh, it's really hard for you to communicate now and to, to make sense. But like communication doesn't necessarily go to zero, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, it might be really, really effortful to put sentences together. There might be a much higher rate of certain kinds of errors, right? So, you know, you might be trying to describe like a, a boy is doing something and you might like, instead of boy, like you might first produce all kinds of like neighbors of boy, like mm-hmm. semantic neighbors or, or sound like phonetic neighbors. But um, eventually the person might understand, oh, okay, you're trying to say boy, mm-hmm. even though the first few things mm-hmm. that came out were a different thing. Mm-hmm. And then you're having to reconstruct. So as a, as a cooperative listener, you're, you're trying to reconstruct what the person is saying. And then also as, like a, as a cooperative and rational producer, you might be also adapting the way you speak, even with its limitations and its constraints, you might be adapting that to help facilitate your listener's understanding. And so it's this sort of like mutual dance where I'm trying to say something, you're trying to understand me, I'm trying to adapt to you so that I maximize the chance of you successfully recovering my intended message. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the, the general why I'm interested in it. That's so it. nice that you like, used your personal experience. To share yeah, this. yeah, 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 I think so. I mean, I think it's always been something that's very interesting to me, like on especially the, the non-native language. I have less experience with like the language impairment side of things, but... Yeah, I mean, I, I think about a lot how powerful language is in its non-typical settings. And mm-hmm. if anything, that might be more powerful, right? It's like, mm-hmm. like think about all the, like even in your history classes, you're, you're talking about all these empires that are moving and trade routes. Like that means there were all these people throughout history who had to like, just like you and me when we're going traveling somewhere and have to try to struggle to communicate. Like a thousand years ago, 2000 years ago, mm-hmm. 5,000 years ago, there were still people struggling to communicate and like trying to be a translator but like they don't actually know that language super well and Mm -hmm. miscommunications misunderstandings but also a lot of cooperative behavior trying to understand Mm -hmm. the other person charitably interpreting what they're saying and like that's just such a universal aspect of of human cognition that i think hasn't been super duper studied Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. we study language acquisition right we study how do people acquire a second language Mm -hmm. but in terms of using it and processing um it less so um so i'm yeah that's that's kind of what i'm interested in and sort of how people use their prior beliefs to to inform interpretations and and things like that so i mean i can give like a very simple example um you have some model inside your mind of how people might make mistakes right so in your in your model you might have something like okay people sometimes say the wrong word right Mm -hmm. so i mean to say boy but i said girl or i Mm -hmm. said man or i said ball or Mm -hmm. something else that's like a neighbor Um, people also sometimes retrace their steps. They'll be talking and then stop, go back to the beginning of the sentence Mm -hmm. and then try again. People also might skip a word. People might also say a lot of, um, um, uh, like Like. all these things. (laughs) And so the 
clean version of the sentence mm -hmm. might look nothing like the what's actually produced, the noisy version of the sentence. But you still interpret the, the, the noisy version and recover something close to the clean sentence. So if I'm, let's say I, I say a sentence like, you know, the man kicked the boy, kicked the ball. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's like not grammatically correct, right? It has like yeah. too many subjects or like, I don't, mm -hmm. what, it's like kind of unclear what's going on. But what do you think is taking place? If I say the man kicked the boy, kicked the ball. The man kicked the boy, kicked the ball. There's no right answer, but what, like maybe like the man kicked the boy who was kicking the ball. Okay, yeah. So one option would be like the man kicked the boy who was kicking the ball or who kicked the ball. Yeah. Okay, so that means that that's kind of mean. So the man was kicking the boy. Yeah. Okay. Is there a different interpretation that would be less violent? <laughs> For sure, there should be. <laughs> there should be. Yeah, but it, like that would be one interpretation, right? Yeah. I mean, another one might be that. Um, Actually, it's supposed to be the man kicked the ball, but instead of ball, they said boy, but then corrected themselves and then oh. said, right? So it might be like the man kicked the that ball, but instead of ball, they said boy, and then it's like, okay, the, man the boy, the ball. The, like, the reason I was confused because yeah. I feel like if you said it with a different intonation, if yeah, you, yeah, you I was trying to say pause, no intonation, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So then this, yeah, yeah, for sure. People definitely use intonation to yeah. try to figure out what people mean. I'm mainly thinking about like, imagine yeah. you're just reading it. Yeah. So you don't actually have the benefit mm -hmm. of the intonation. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah. So it could be the man kicked the ball and then just boy was a mistake and then they backtracked and corrected mm -hmm. it. It could be actually, it was supposed to be the boy kicked the ball and they said man by mistake and then had to backtrack. So was like, anyway, there's, mm -hmm. all of these are possible. Yeah. So then what you have to do is you have to balance two things. You have to balance, okay, which of the meanings has like a high prior probability? Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe the one where the man is kicking the boy yeah, yeah, yeah. is like then relatively less likely. <laughs> the most ideal. Yeah. But then you also have to balance like the other part is, well, how likely is each of those errors mm -hmm. to occur, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, some errors are more likely than others. If you like assuming one or two errors is probably more reasonable than assuming that like every single word was an error. Mm -hmm. Like you want to find something that's close to what they said and has like relatively few changes that you need to make, but then also has like a high prior, you know, probability in terms of being plausible mm -hmm. as a meaning. Um, and all these kinds of interesting processing things are happening. And you're doing this incrementally, right? So at each word in the sentence, you sort of have to, you're gaining one new piece of information. You know, like you do this word by word by mm -hmm. word. Um, and you can look at how people interpret sentences like that, right? So you can ask them, like, what do you think the sentence means? You can look at their reading times. You can look at things like, okay, like how, how long does it take them to read sentences like this? Are there certain words where they like mm -hmm. show a big effect of like surprise and slowing down? Um, and so there's many ways that you can study the way people process these kinds of noisy sentences mm -hmm. um, that are like, yeah, outside the standard distribution of clean, um, clean language. Um, yeah, so that's like sort of at a high level what that's I want to do. Yeah, sounds like a very impactful. Work. Well, we'll see. I mean, as it is with most academic projects, it's like there's some interesting idea there. What you end up producing is something very abstract and kind of removed from practical applications. And then down the line, maybe. Oh, yeah, long term, I'm sure. Long term, it there could can be applications. Yeah, turn it into applications, but um, yeah. Are you interested more in just like, I mean, just like exploring different ideas? And aspects of language as opposed to like trying to solve yeah problem with I, i'm like kind of just a general language nerd mm -hmm. and i like language yeah, and stuff. i like languages <laughs> and yeah i mm -hmm. i've always been pretty broad in my interests mm -hmm. instead of like just some people come into their phd and they, they have one thing yeah. that they, they really want to work mm -hmm. on and they just work on that mm -hmm. for five years mm -hmm. and they're insanely productive because mm -hmm. they like come in with so much direction mm -hmm. um i don't i didn't have anything like that like mm -hmm. in terms of one specific thing within language kind of bounced around a lot between different kinds of things that's sometimes been hard honestly like as a grad student to mm -hmm. feel like i don't have a clear path like i've just sort of been bouncing around um but also it's like a you know there's this explore exploit trade-off right you sort of have to explore a lot of things yeah. before you can really know what's worth like spending your time on mm -hmm. and if you commit to something too early and you find out later that, wait, this is not actually what I'm really passionate about, then, yeah, that could be not ideal either. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'm still trying to, 
figure out like a clear research like program. Like I feel like by the end of your PhD, you're supposed to have like, this is my research program. Mm -hmm. Like if I were going to start a lab today, like mm -hmm. here is what the lab would be called and here is like what we're going to study. And I'm not quite at that stage yet. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, but. I mean, yeah, you still have a lot of time. I think it's yeah. normal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Encourage everyone to learn languages. It's fun. I suck at languages. Like I, English is the only language that I speak like really well. And like you can judge for yourself whether I actually speak English <laughs> well or not. But it's like English is the only do. language in which I'm like really comfortable. I've studied a lot of other languages, mm -hmm. which, you know, I sound like a baby and or mm -hmm. not. Actually, babies are really good. I shouldn't insult babies. <laughs> you know, like my Japanese sounds like a baby because I lived in Japan only when I was a kid. My Russian sounds like some weird foreigner who doesn't know what he's talking about. My Spanish is, yeah, I don't I feel know. I like still you're too self-critical. But, but, but my point is, like, learn it because it's, it's such a good investment. It's like you're, it doesn't cost a lot of money to learn a language. Like, you know, like just Duolingo is free, Duolingo. <laughs> you know, like, or like. They should have sponsored this yeah. video. <laughs> and just the payoff could be huge, right? Like you're just, it's a whole new way of seeing language like all the i don't know anyway that's just that's a bit irrelevant to my uh like research um interest or whatever but it's just like a plug mm -hmm. to you know don't don't give up on language learning it can be hard in as like an english speaker because english is so like globally dominant that it sometimes feels like there's no real need to ever yeah. learn another language mm -hmm. but that's like so sad too because it's mm -hmm. like you know i don't know there's so many cool languages in the world Sadly, a lot of them are going extinct. Yeah. yeah. To be honest, like in my experience, when I was like in middle school, I, I w loved languages and I wanted to become a polyglot and like yeah. know many languages. Yeah. Yeah. And there was like this very sp particular website where like they promised you to teach you the whole language in 10 lessons. <laughs> Different, every language, okay? <laughs> every major language. And I was like watching those videos yeah. and I was like, I'm going to, become that kind of person but then i think like once i started high school i realized that there is well first of all it's not my priority to become <laughs> polyglot and have other interests but then also that's how i felt like how you what you mentioned that like english is so prevalent it's like everywhere and yeah. why would you ever need to learn any other language when you yeah. can communicate in english yeah. so then for a long time i just focused on english mm -hmm. then recently i realized that actually there is value in yeah. learning yeah, yeah, yeah. other languages and yeah. different perspectives. Yeah. What would be the next language if you could if you could study one language without interrupting your you know anything else about your your PhD or anything? What would it be? I mean, to be honest, like I've been learning like French and Duolingo for some okay. time. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of the past couple of years, like during the pandemic and a bit after. Um, maybe Italian because I'm going to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. know. Exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. But it also, it's like it's nice that like some of the languages are like kind of similar. Yeah, to yeah, each yeah, other. yeah. And then it's easier. It's much easier. Them. Yeah, I, I like every language you learn, the next one gets easier to learn. I think, and especially if, like, I don't know, I took Latin in mm -hmm. college, you know, and like I, learning Spanish after Latin, is way easier than mm -hmm. learning a new language from scratch. Like, right? Like, it's just there's so much shared grammar, so much shared vocabulary. I mean, even with English. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's. It's like what I would call low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like yeah. if you know English, languages like French, Spanish, German, like mm -hmm. Western European languages are low-hanging fruit compared to like learning like Arabic yeah. or Chinese or, you know, something that's much more like dif like different and mm -hmm. distant. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like, why not? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And if you learn like the top 10 languages in the world, like in terms of number of speakers, right? Like, you'll be able to communicate with basically half of the world's population, essentially, right? So, mm -hmm. at least. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. If you learn, like, English, Russian, Chinese, Hindi, like, even those four will get you to, like, most places, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, yeah. Anyway, that's it's always fun. It makes you feel like – it also humbles you, you know? It's like you're, like, having to ask, like, well, how do you say uh, table? And, like, how do you say water? And, like, mm -hmm. such basic things. But that humbling experience of becoming like having to ask how to say such basic stuff, I think also brings back a certain like childlike joy because you're just like you're just talking about basic yeah. stuff. Like, can I have some water, please? And like, 
you're learning new sounds that combine to have that meaning and you get to like see the world through the eyes of like a child again yeah. so like i still remember how i was like learning english in middle school i was so obsessed and i just like printed or like just wrote the name of every object in my room and like Stick it, it, yeah, room. every like yeah. the whole room was <laughs> having the so sounds. Oh my gosh! That's but so I remember funny. I was like, "Oh my god, carpet, <laughs> carpet." It <Carpet. laughs> yeah. was hard for me. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, wait. I, I'm gonna do that now. <laughs> <laughs> All my friends, whenever you next come over to my place, you're gonna see little stickers. <laughs> <everywhere>. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the, the most effective way to learn yeah. language, but that's how I did it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, anyway, this was super fun. Thanks yeah. for all the amazing. Thank you so much for uh, this very interesting conversation. Cool. I'm so happy we recorded it. Yes. Yeah. 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 I I'm glad. I I feel like yeah we were trying to like record both episodes like from the collab in one mm -hmm. session. That would have been I think ambitious. But a very long session. Yes. But I'm no. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad we we're able to complete the exchange, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank right. you again. Thank you. Don't forget to leave a comment. And yeah. um, if like and subscribe. <laughs> yes, like and subscribe. And I will see you very soon. <laughs> very soon. <laughs> very soon. <laughs> that sounded dangerous. <laughs> see you very soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.